Good morning. Welcome to our second session in our training program of In Search of Jesus. And this is the session specifically dealing with the creation. And so we're going to be covering Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. Now this is where we ended up last time. And we had first we just finished talking about the fourth day. So, let me pause right here before we get started into the uh, fifth day and discuss a few concepts just to bring everybody up to speed on what we're doing. So, we keep seeing this statement that was just there that it was morning or it was evening and it was morning and it was, and they mentioned which day of the creation this is. Now again, we are coming at this from the concept that there are multiple creations. Each day is at least one creation that God has commanded. So, do you notice something about this statement that it is evening and it is morning? The problem is, is that when you do the measurement that this is evening and this is morning, you're only dealing with a period of 12 hours. So when God is saying in his uh, presentation to Moses that it's evening and it's morning, he is not talking about a complete day. So let me take a look at what the words are in the Hebrew just in case there is some hidden message there. So I went to the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and the word for evening is the Hebrew word ereb. And so I know some of you are thinking, oh, let's check it out in the Paleo-Hebrew, because we have discovered that in the Paleo-Hebrew, there are many codes and messages hidden there that we do not realize. Well, I hate to burst the bubble. I did go to the Ereb, and there were three letters, the Alwin, there's the Bet, and there is the Resh. And again, the Bet and the Resh will give us the word Bar for son of, but the Alwin does not have any additional meaning to it. So we're not going to find anything in the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet to give us some better understanding of this. According to the Strong's Exhaustive, it means, well, look at that, evening means sunset, or it can mean night. Now, the word for morning is the Hebrew word bokur. And again, nothing in the Paleo-Hebrew, and according to Strong's, it means the end of the night, it means the coming of day, or it means sunrise. So. I have to stop and ask myself, why did God use these references if he was not identifying a 24-hour day? Now, I'm going to let you know up front that we do believe it is a 24-hour day. And God, in other places in the Bible, will confirm he is talking about a day that lasts for 24 hours. Well, as I do most of my research, I go to somebody that leaves me in the dust, and every time he starts teaching, it goes over my head, and I have to go back and do three or four times before I understand what he's saying. This is the late Dr. Chuck Missler. Now, he has a DVD set, about yay big, with a commentary that goes with it, talking about Genesis. And Dr. Missler is brilliant, he was actually part of a government think tank for a number of years, and he has information that most of us can't even get a hold of. So, as he was doing his discussion on Genesis, he made this observation from his interaction with various rabbis. Now, these are not Christians, these are the Jewish rabbis. And the rabbis are telling him that they interpret Ereb, or evening, as being chaos, something that is out of order, something that is disorganized, something that is literally a mess. And so that was their interpretation for the word Ereb. And then their interpretation for Boker 
is the word order. So literally what the rabbis are suggesting in their teachings is that God is speaking or moving from a position of chaos and disorganization and then through his command and through his process of creating he slides things over and shifts it into something that is organized it is in order it makes sense so god takes chaos and out of the chaos he creates order and they believe that is why his reference to evening and morning are used the way that they are there is an ending to the chaos the end of the day and then there is order as the new beginning the beginning of the morning and again for those of you who are not familiar with this this is where the jews get their concept of measuring time i.e their days from sunset to sunset God is starting with sunset. So this is why we find that the Sabbath, per the Jews, is from Friday sunset until Saturday sunset. And if God was speaking of a 24-hour period, that he would say it was sunset and it was sunset to cover that complete day. Obviously, he is not giving us the concept of a complete 24-hour day, he is trying to create a different image. Whenever you find an irregularity in Scripture, it is God trying to call attention to this. In this case, the rabbis say that God is telling us he is starting with chaos and he is going to move it into an organized structure. So, we are talking about a 24-hour day. I remember back in, whew, I hate to mention this because that's in the last century. No, that, that was actually in the last millennium. I am not that old. But back in the 60s, we were still allowed to talk about the Bible. And one of the things that we talked about in our public schools was creation and I remember very specifically that our teachers were suggesting that maybe the day was not really meant to be a day but it was to identify a period of time evening and morning a separate period of time and they were suggesting that it might be an age the beginning of the creation process and the end of the creation process and that is very true. It is the beginning of the creation process, and then it's the end of God's creation process with at least one creation per day. So they tried to hedge and say, oh, this is actually referring to an age. And an age could be thousands or even millions of years old. And this is how they tried to deal with the aging of the earth and how they tried to deal with the idea of dinosaurs. So we have learned a great deal since the 1960s and it is the fact that when you go back to the Hebrew that when they're talking about the word day it is the word yam in the Hebrew and 2,088 times it is translated as day. Now, there are about 14 times in the Strong's it mentions it was translated as year, and another few times it's translated as chronicles. But traditionally, it is referring to a day, i.e. 24 hours. <laughs> now, to clear up any confusion, God specifically notes that he created the world in a period of six 24-hour days when he was discussing the law of the Sabbath with Moses up on Mount Sinai. We find this in Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, 
the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Again, it is not that God was tired. We did not wear God out. The concept of resting means that God ended the creative process. Now, as we are discussing this process, keep in mind a few things. We are talking about a day having an activity that if you were to follow the normal laws of physics, i.e. the nebular theory that we discussed in our first day, where there is a gaseous cloud out in space called a nebula. And as some of the gas particles and atoms and molecules connect with one or the other, it becomes a little bit stronger with its gravitational pull and it pulls in more and more and more other molecules until it starts to compress down. And if there is enough matter there, the pressure and the heat from the compression will ignite and turn this into a star. If there is not enough mass in that nebula, it compresses down and it heats and becomes molten and the end result is that it will eventually using the gases of hydrogen and oxygen create water creating a vapor this lands on the surface of the molten planet and cools it until at the end it turns into a sphere of rock with a molten core and it has water covering it so god compresses the day, compresses the action, and completes it within 24 hours. And we can see this process happening elsewhere in our universe. There are nebular clouds, and there are planets that are almost a sun, but are not yet a sun. For example, the planet Jupiter. It is gaseous. It is not finished compressing but it has done as much compressing as it can with what mass it has. And it was not enough mass to ignite into a sun, but the scientists are referring to it as a mini sun because it is giving off more heat and more light than it receives from our sun. And if you ever saw the movie 2010, based on the book by Arthur C. Clarke, at the end of the movie, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, the alien race begins to increase the mass of Jupiter until Jupiter explodes and becomes a mini sun in our solar system. And this mini sun is now the sun that will be giving warmth and light to one of the moons of Jupiter where life can be uh, propagated by the aliens. So, the nebular theory does bear out. It is what we are seeing taking place in the universe, but God specifically selected various nebulas and he compressed them very quickly in a 24 hour period to get that end result. So God worked for seven days and then on the, for six days and on the seventh day he rested and God blessed the Sabbath, and he made it hallowed or holy, and it is to be honored and respected. Now, let me talk about what has been called the Scopes Trial, or you may know it by a different title. It's more commonly referred to as the Monkey Trial. And this was a case that started in the early part of July, 1925 and it finished at the end of July, July 21st, 1925. Now what this involved was a school teacher by the name John Thomas Scopes. Let me give you some quick background. There was a farmer in Tennessee who was concerned about his kids going to school and coming back with a bunch of teachings that were not in line with the Bible. So he went to his state senator and they passed a law in Tennessee that made it illegal to use taxpayer funds in a school to teach evolution. Now, 
What this does, it created a serious conflict in the state of Tennessee. Because in the state of Tennessee, there was another law. And that law mandated they had to use a specific textbook and teach all of that textbook in the public school. And there was a chapter in that textbook that taught evolution. So either way, somebody was breaking a law. If you followed the first law and used the textbook you were mandated to use, you would be breaking the law that forbade the teaching of evolution. If you did not teach evolution, you would be breaking the law about using the textbook and teaching every part of it to the students. It was not a good law. So the American Civil Liberties Union got involved and they decided to challenge the law. It was passed only as a favor for a group of Christians in the state and it was never meant to be enforced. So the ACLU goes to John Thomas Scopes. He's about 21 years old. He's very young in his career. And they get him to volunteer to be charged with breaking the law. Now, at trial, Mr. Scopes admitted he does not remember teaching evolution. Now, he says he probably had to because it was in the textbook, but he personally had no recollection of teaching evolution to his classes. The ACLU recruited three students and they perjured them for lack of a better description. They brought him in and they coached him into testifying to the grand jury that Mr. Scopes had taught them evolution and they were having all kinds of issues because of this. So the case went to trial and immediately they brought in the most agnostic defense attorney that they could find to represent Mr. Scopes. They brought in the strongest evangelical attorney to uh, I'm sorry, the agnostic was the defense and the evangelistic attorney was the prosecution. Now, Mr. Scopes never testified in the trial. And as they were going to the trial, the judge made it very clear that he was not going to receive any evidence relating to the book of Genesis. So he barred the Bible and everybody's experts were now gone. Well, in a surprise turn of events, the prosecuting or the defense attorney uh, summoned the prosecutor attorney as a witness on the last days of the trial. And the prosecuting attorney was very evangelical and felt very confident in all of his doctrines and teachings. And he says, oh, I don't have a problem talking about, you know, creation versus evolution. I can blow them out of the water. So he was on the stand. And one of the things that he was doing was that they came at him and they said, you know, Mr. Prosecutor, do you believe that when the Bible says it was evening and morning was the first day or the second day or the third day, was that a literal 24 hour day? Now, this is back when science was becoming more prominent than religion. And the concern was if you believe the Bible, you'd have a hard time discussing how you had, you know, millions of years or billions of years. And so he flinched and he went with the original thing that I heard back in 1960 that they were ages and they could have been more than 24 hours. Well, to his surprise and to the court's surprise, the defense attorney read that passage that I read to you from Exodus 20, 11, that God worked in six days. And Jesus also noted that the day was six, you know, are there not 12 hours in a day? And so as a result, they blew him out of the water. 
They totally discredited him as a Bible expert. Now, the craziness of the case was that the judge the following day ended up barring the testimony of the prosecuting attorney because it dealt with religion and it dealt with Genesis and specifically Genesis chapter 1. So all of that testimony was removed from the record and the only reason we are aware of that is that one, it was in all the newspapers and quoted at that very day of all of his statements and comments and two, there is a movie with Spencer Tracy called Inherit the Wind which is the Scopes trial. The final result is that Mr. Scopes was found guilty and he was fined $100. They took the case up on the appeal and at the appeal level at the Supreme Court of Tennessee, they rejected the appeal for every argument that they raised because they were not valid arguments. What is supposed to be done in a court of law is to discuss law and not religion. And was this a good law or did this law violate the Constitution and limit somebody's freedom of speech or freedom of religion? And so it got shot down and they basically recommended to the defense attorney, don't bother bringing it back. So for all of its notoriety, the monkey trial was worthless. But it did address the issue of 24-hour days. Now, I was asked this question, why six days? Now, the question was, why can't God do all of this in a single day? And I will have to be honest, God could do this in a single day. And I don't know why he chose six days, but for some reason he chose to spread the creations out over a six day period. Perhaps he felt it was necessary that when he gave the command for the water to bring forth life or for the earth to bring forth plants, that there needed to be adequate time for all of the life to go through the procreation process that there is the life that is initially created and then it has the seed within itself, the DNA. And so it has to procreate and produce duplicates of itself and not cross over different species. So I suspect that it had something to do with God allowing his creation the time to fulfill the commandment that he made. So again, God is a God of order. He is moving from chaos over to a position of order. And one of the things that we've been discussing is that there is more than one creation. There are multiple creations. And as God is creating his world, he is going in a very orderly fashion. He did not create man and leave him hanging out in space while he got around to creating a planet, while he got around to separating the water and creating land, while he got around to putting plants, and while he got around to putting food to support man. God did everything in the proper order, starting at the very basic of the environment and building one step at a time until on the sixth day, the world was finally able to support human life. Now, in some cases, God gave a single command on a single day, and he allowed 24 hours for his command to be completed. Now, the first day, the third day, and the sixth days are going to be exceptions to this rule. There are multiple creations on those three days. On day one, God creates the heavens. And this involves all of your stars, your planets, your moons, your galaxies, and the entire space as we refer to it, the final frontier. 
He brings together what appears to be a gaseous cloud, we call a nebula, and in one day it is compressed into a sphere that is basically a rock, and it is now covered with water as the various hydrogen and oxygen atoms came together to form water and to rain on the molten surface until it finally cooled. At the end of day one, there was now an atmosphere surrounding the planet, there was now a planet, there was now water, and there was now light to allow the atmosphere to reflect the light for day and for night. So there were multiple creations carried out on the first day. Now we had the cloud, the sphere, the water, and light. On day two, God takes what he has already made and he does not create, he adjusts. He is still commanding his creation to do something. So I'm gonna leave it as an act of creation. He separates the waters from above from the waters below. So at this point, we get the concept that the earth had been a sphere floating in space, covered with water, and the water had been both a solid liquid and probably more of a steam or a vapor in various points of transition between gas and water. So he completes the process. He separates the water vapor and he moves the water vapor up and he keeps the water on the surface on the surface. So, in other words, he makes a sky. That's what that word firmament means. And that drove me crazy for years. God created a firmament. Well, I have no idea what that is, but I'll just move on because I don't want to stop and research it. Well, here I am decades later, and I've had to do my research, and he creates sky. So there is a surface of water, there is sky, and now there is a water canopy on the outskirts of our atmosphere on the edge of space. So this is where the water canopy is supposed to have come from. It is surrounding the earth. And this water canopy would block a lot of the solar radiation from the sun. And again, for the first few days, it also blocked visibility of the space outside of our world. So this may account for why we had longer life as human beings prior to the flood, because we were not exposed to x-rays and microwaves and ultraviolet rays and all the radiation coming from the sun that break down various parts of our body. So it's a simple process. He was simply rearranging what he had already made. But again, I will qualify this as a second creation because he commanded the creation and the creation, even though inanimate and lifeless, responded. So God commanded and his command was carried out. And as a result, we have day two. Day three, the third day of creation. And again, God is not making something brand new. Again, on day three, God is taking what he has already created, and now he is separating the land from the water. He's not making new land. He's not making more water. But think about a glass of water. If I were to drop a pebble in here, a small rock, and seal this up so the water cannot evaporate, it will remain a rock covered in water until something intervenes and changes that situation. So again, we drop the rock in the water, now is surrounded by water, and that is basically the earth at the beginning of day three. So God steps in, and he commands 
the water to receive. And if you get to the book of Job, the book of Job was written probably 400 years before the book of Genesis. Job lived 400 years before Moses. He was back at the time of Abraham. And so when Job is going through his trials, at the end of the book of Job, we have God confronting Job and putting Job in his place. And as he's going through this thing, he is basically saying, where were you when I did all of these things? And he is discussing his creation. Where were you when I hung the world in space? Where were you when I called forth the stars? Where were you? And in one of those things, he states that he set the limits on the waters and they can go this far and no further. So all of our fear and concern about global warming, if we believe what God is telling us, are unfounded. You know, God said when he brought Noah forth from the ark, he says, I will never again destroy the world by water. I will never again flood the world. So with all these talks of global warming and all the land being covered in water again, is a violation of God's promise to his creation. So God commanded the waters to pull back. He took the rock that was underneath and he raised it to the surface. So up to this point, God has made the earth and he is now adjusting his creation. He is taking physical material that he has made and he is making adjustments on it. So he's taking what is there, he is moving it around. So he is now about to move into day four. No, part of day three still. So at the day three, as it goes on, after the waters have been pulled back and the land has been revealed, we now have lifeless rock. There is no life in the sea. There is no life on the ground. There is nothing there to evolve. That's the key point. You cannot bring life where there is no life. Science is not that good. Even today, we cannot make life out of no life. We have to take life that is already there and adjust it. We have all the ingredients that make up our body. We can create a perfect replica of a DNA strand, but even if we join them together, they do not produce life. That is something that only God has been able to do. So we have rock, we have water, and we have air. That's all there is, that's all that's available. But God is not done with his work on day three. Again, day three has multiple creative actions. God giving multiple commands. So, God is going to create once more. He is going to make something out of nothing. And on day three, this is going to involve the creation of plant life. Now God commands and the plants come forth. Stop and think about that. There were no plants. There were no seeds. There was no life. So when God commands, let the earth bring forth grass. Let the earth bring forth herb bearing seed. What was he commanding? He was commanding something that was not able to do what he was commanding it to do. That's why it was a miracle. So the ground which was dead had no life in it is now able to produce the plant, the grass, the herbs, the trees, and the food. God is building an environment from the ground or the nebula up. He starts with nothing, you know, and God created 
And our word there was bara in the Hebrew, which means to call forth out of nothing. He created a nebula, a gas cloud. He calls forth a planet. He has rock and water. He calls forth air. And as a result, there is now sunlight. Because until you have an atmosphere, there is light all over the place, but it cannot be seen because light must reflect at a 90 degree angle. So it has everything that is needed to sustain the plant life. God is building his creation one step at a time. Now, once the plant life came into place in the environment, it came to life and he introduced the plant life. Now, the creation of plant life also introduced the carbon dioxide oxygen cycles. The plants cleanse our atmosphere. During the day, it brings in the carbon dioxide into the plants and the plants process the carbon dioxide for their needs and then they release oxygen. So this is an interesting biological machine that God has created. It's a massive air filter and it is cleansing the air. It's filtering the air and as it's cycling through the plants, the cloud covering begins to burn off. And now with the water vapor covering us, the clouds have been removed and we move on to day four. Now here we are introduced to the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now you have to pay attention to the wording because it doesn't say that God created the sun, the moon, and the stars on the fourth day. It does note that he created them, but we see them all the way back in Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens. And the heavens would include the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now we've had the discussion a couple of classes ago about whether God was the source of light up until day four, or could it have been that the sun, the moon, and the stars were the source, and that as of day four, they were now disclosed and visible from Moses' point of view on Mount Sinai. Now, God's getting ready to move to a more advanced kind of life. On day five, God goes back to the creative process. He brings life where there is no life. There is not microbes and bacteria and amino acids floating in the ocean. It is hydrogen and oxygen and maybe some sediment from here and there, but basically it is very pure. There has not been life up until the point that plant life was introduced. So on day five, we now have the marine life. On day five, we now have birds. They are called forth. Each have a DNA that is designed to ensure that they will be reproduced and copied exactly the way that they were made. The environment is now able to sustain this level of complex life, and so God now creates this level of life. So, going back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. Yep, we're back to the Bible. All right. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature. Now, we had the question about why is this singular? Well, it's the same thing with fowl. Fowl refers to all kinds of bird, but it is a description of a kind. So here we have the moving creature is an umbrella. It is a label that covers all moving creatures in the water. And the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Verse 21, and God created great whales and every living creature that moves 
which the water brought forth abundantly again after their kind. DNA coding to ensure exact reproduction. Now, we had this one question about evolution versus creation. There is evolution within a species. That is what Darwin was seeing on the island that he was doing his research on. And now if you were to go, let's say, up to uh, Alaska, the north part of Alaska, where it's always cold, and you have two kinds of rabbits inhabiting that part of Alaska, and one of them produces white fur, the other produces brown fur. What's going to happen is that after several years, the predators are going to pick off all the brown fur rabbits because they're easy to find. And the white fur rabbits are harder to find, so they will survive, they will escape the predators, and they will continue to reproduce and produce white furred rabbits, while the brown rabbits are being wiped out by the predators and eventually destroyed and becoming extinct. We see this adjustment to their environment. It is not necessarily a rabbit transforming into an orangutan. You know, it's not a snail becoming a turtle. It is one species of rabbit being superior to the other species of rabbit in that given environment. So, God created great whales and every living creature that moves which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Verse 22, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. So I think this is what's completing the rest of the 24-hour process as these reproductive cycles are going about producing copies and filling the entire earth. Now keep in mind that God had designed things to work a certain way and he is basically going through the natural. He made probably the male and female whale. Now, how many he made, I don't know, but they are reproducing. And each cycle is coming faster until at the end of the 24-hour cycle, you have a lot of whales all over the earth. Things like that. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. I need to get a drum roll here if I can because we're coming up to the last day of creation. The big day. Verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. So, the question came up is, where did the bacteria come from? When did we have microorganisms and things like this? That would be here at the beginning of the sixth day because this is stuff that creeps upon the earth. This is where your insects come in. This is where all of your reptiles come in. And so on this day, God brings forth all of the mammals all of the reptiles, all of the insects, and all of any other kind of life on the dry land that you can imagine. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. Again, one species does not become another species. A goat does not turn into a gazelle. A camel does not become a dog. Their DNA structure ensures exact reproduction. There is no missing link. 
because they are separate creations and they are to be produced after their kind. And everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind and God saw that it was good. Now, I don't want to be considered a heretic, but I'm, I'm not sure I would consider everything good. I'm not a big fan of spiders. I don't think we need spiders. Of course, God created them. Uh, lately, I don't think we really need mosquitoes or fleas because we keep getting bit by mosquitoes and fleas. And I'm really not a big fan of flies. But God said that they were good. Now, during a discussion, someone brought up the concept of Leviathan. If you read the book of Job, and I believe it's also mentioned in the Psalms, there is a creature called Leviathan. And in fact, in the book of Job, when God is dressing Job down and showing his intelligence, and here's what I made and here's what it does, he mentions Leviathan to Job. <clears throat> now, Again, Job was 400 years before Moses, so this makes it probably the oldest book of the Bible. God comes to Job. God is putting Job in his place. And Job is the creation, while God is the creator. And so he starts off, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? He then mentions Leviathan and Bohemoth. Now, these are two very large creatures. Because they are not with us, people have started to speculate exactly what is Leviathan, exactly what is Bohemoth. Well, the book of Job mentions about Leviathan having scales. And it also mentions that God puts a hook in the jaw of Leviathan and draws it to him. So, Bible scholars are thinking in terms of a fish. And because it is so large, they say that this is probably the whale. Well, go back and read the book of Job more carefully. Pay attention to the details of the description. <clears throat> this is found in Job chapter 41. And God is actually describing a dragon. It is a dragon with wings and it flies and he calls to it and he's petting it. He also mentions that it can breathe fire. A fire breathing dragon is described in scripture. <clears throat> How is this possible? Well, glad you asked. There is an insect we call the bombardier beetle. The bombardier beetle is very interesting because it has two glands in its body and each gland produces a separate chemical. Now, if these two chemicals unite with oxygen, they burst into flames. And so the bombardier beetle can spray, the way a skunk sprays its odor, it can spray these two chemicals out of its backside and when they hit the air, they ignite and create a fire. And so again, the same thing can happen with a dragon. If they have those two glands producing those two chemicals, when the dragon opens its mouth and sprays it out, it's going to hit the air and it's going to ignite. And when it closes off the glands, the fire will stop so the dragon is not burned. <clears throat> If you go into the records, you will be surprised to find that in the different records from China, there are drawings and illustrations and accounts of how they hunted actual dragons, probably about yay big, according to the drawings. And they pretty much systematically destroyed the dragon by killing it for sport and bringing it into the arenas and killing it for entertainment. Let's go over and look at the Bohemoth, Job chapter 40, verses 15 through 24. Now, some are suggesting that this is an ape, big ape, strong. Some suggest it's a crocodile, 
and some even suggest it's an elephant. These are all the Bible scholars who are trying to find something currently in the world that they can point to and say, oh, that's what this is. See, here is their problem. They are still thinking of dinosaurs and dragons as either a separate time period from man or a fantasy creature. We have the book of Psalms mentions the unicorn. I, for one, believe at one time, someplace, somewhere, there was a creature that probably was a unicorn. But the scholars say, oh no, there are no unicorns. And I agree, that's probably true today. And they say, but there never have been any unicorns. Well, then what are they talking about when they say unicorn in the scriptures? Oh, that's a rhinoceros. And if you challenge their thought process, the reason they say that is because they do not believe in unicorns. It's a circular reason. There can't be unicorns, therefore it has to be referring to something else. And again, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. Again, in this case, Bible scholars are looking for something that's big and lives on the land. So they go for apes, they go for crocodiles, because there's a tail, and they also go for an elephant. But if you read the description, it talks about this being a dinosaur. And notice the wording in Job chapter 40. It is a dinosaur who, quote, is living with man. Dinosaurs and man coexisted. They are not separated by millions of years. Back in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, we were taught that. We believe that. <clears throat> there is a fossil that is on the internet. You can take a look at it. And it is a fossilized footprint of a dinosaur and the fossilized footprint of a man superimposed. They were there at the same time. And the way that the fossil is created is it is buried under intense pressure and becomes rock. Or does it? Interesting point I want to talk about here. So we have what my girlfriend and I refer to as the Jurassic Gnome Park. She loves gnomes. My ex-wife loved gnomes. She loves dinosaurs. I enjoy dinosaurs. And we have put everything together and put it out in the atrium out front. And this is what it looks like. There are gnomes and dinosaurs scattered throughout the atrium to welcome our visitors. Now, one of the more ferocious of the dinosaurs is the Velociraptor. And we were introduced to the Velociraptor in the very first Jurassic Park movie. Very vicious. Well, in the Jurassic Park, in the very first movie, they began to suggest that the birds are what evolved from the dinosaurs. We've been teaching that our reptiles and our lizards are the descendants of dinosaurs, but that's not the truth. But in Jurassic Park, they had some new scientists with a new scientific theory to sound more intellectual. And he says, oh no, look at the dinosaurs. Look at their bone structures. Look at their design so that their bones are hollow and they can do this and they can do that. And they started the theory that birds in our world today evolved from the dinosaurs. Again, remember what the Bible said. There were the marine life and the fowl on day five, and the things that were on the land, i.e. dinosaurs, was on day six. So, they even began to suggest that the very fierce Velociraptor should have feathers. 
because he is the ancestor of birds. And I love this, how Hollywood jumps on the bandwagon. So when they moved from the Jurassic Park series over to the Jurassic World trilogy, in the final installment, they now have this one scientist, the one that started putting all the dinosaurs together and the eggs back in the first movie. And he's talking about the fact that, oh yes, we've corrupted the DNA strands of our dinosaurs. None of these are true dinosaurs because we used tree frog DNA to fill in the blanks. And that's what all of our problems were. And now in the very last movie of the installment, he's saying, oh, we fixed the DNA. The DNA is now pure. And suddenly the Velociraptor in the last movie has feathers, or at least the beginning of feathers. So, even though birds were made first on the first day, and dinosaurs were made later on the sixth day, they try to suggest that the birds evolved from dinosaurs. We are dealing with six 24-hour days. Now scientists claim that we are dealing with billions of years. And I mentioned the Nobel Prize winner a couple of classes ago who went through the process that I went through and says, oh, here is some amino acid and it gets zapped by a lightning bolt while it's in a pool of goo and it forms this little one cell microorganism called life. Unfortunately, it doesn't live very long. It's living in toxic goo, and the toxic goo kills it in about two minutes. So you wait another several million years, there's now another exact pool of goo, and it gets zapped with the same lightning bolt, and oh look, here is another single cell organism, and it has everything the last one had, but for some reason, this is the new improved model. And this one can survive the, galact the, the toxic goo in the pool but it dies because it can't breathe. It can't get oxygen. So another cycle, another new life form, a new improved life form. This one can now inhale, can't exhale, it dies. Another few million years, here comes the new improved model. It can inhale, it can exhale, survive the toxic goo. Next thing comes along, this one is now new and improved because it can now have water, can eliminate the water. It dies in a matter of a few days. You do it again, a new life form comes along, it can survive the toxic, it can breathe, it can exhale, it can uh, drink, it can eliminate, but it starves to death. So it has to do it again, and now this new life form can go through this, and it can survive the sludge, it can breathe, it can exhale, it can drink, it can eliminate, it can eat, dies, comes back, the new one can eliminate the waste, and this goes on over and over, and finally the, the microorganism has to have like eight or nine new and improved versions to get where it is, and now it has to be able to move to find new water and new food. So we're talking about 10 or 12 cycles, millions and millions and millions of years of everything coming together in the perfect collection and the lightning zapping it, and it survives, but again, it is going to die because it can't reproduce. One generation, and that's it. So you realize it just doesn't work. So there was a Nobel Prize winning scientist who took my theory, yeah, my theory, and he did the same argument, but he says it won't work in our current system. So he changed the system by saying, let's make it billions of years rather than millions of years. And he did, without any evidence, without any proof to support it, the scientific community says, oh yeah, it's either that or except creation. Now it's billions of years. And then to top it off, he says, oh, by the way, it had to be aliens that kept everything going and improving each model to get what we finally have. No evidence, no proof, no documentation. So they're claiming that we are now dealing with billions of years. So they're claiming that petrified wood is a result of millions of years of fossilization on some original piece of wood. They're claiming the Grand Canyon is millions of years old as a result of erosion from a river 
running through it. Several years ago, our church invited a speaker to come to our location where we were on kitchen, and he was a microbiologist. And that's an actual PhD he has in microbiology, looking at the, it's actually what's called a uh, microbiologist, micro, microevolutionist, and looking at the bugs and the things in our water and in our uh, microscopic world, he uses that to prove evolution. And so as a result, he would claim that he could have creationists for breakfast every day. They could not stand up to all of his knowledge and all of his proof and all of his evidence. Well, he became part of the Mount St. Helens project and Mount St. Helens was becoming an active volcano once more. So they set up a base station and they monitored Mount St. Helens for several months. And then one night, I think it was a Saturday, they decided, you know, we're getting awful dirty and grimy and smelly and what I wouldn't give for a nice fresh bed and a nice shower and some clean clothes and some good food. So everybody packed up except for one person and they headed out to Las Vegas and they left one person behind to man the base station. I guess he didn't smell as bad as the rest of them. Next morning, they're flying back into the base station. They get a radio broadcast from the gentleman who was manning the base station. And he said, Mount St. Helens is, and it cut off. <clears throat> what had happened was Mount St. Helen had erupted. It was a bombastic cloud of steam and heat and volcanic ash that destroyed the entire base camp, and if they had been there, they all would have been destroyed. So, the man that was manning the station had been destroyed, and all they were doing, they would have been killed if they had been there. Now, in the aftermath of the eruption, they began doing their research, and they discovered a truth about something called massive geological events. In a matter of days, they found conditions similar to the Grand Canyon. They had been produced in a matter of days, not millions or billions of years. Rocks that they knew were only days old when they sent them to the lab measured at being millions of years old. They found this tree in the water. And when they took it out of the water, they found that this part was still a wooden tree. And in the middle was a section that had been changed into coal. And the other half that was down in the water they found had been petrified and was petrified wood. So the petrified forest was not millions of years old. It's the result of a massive geological event. The Grand Canyon is the result of another massive geological event, and that would be the flood. So when you see the Grand Canyon as the result of a massive geological event and not erosion, a lot of the mysteries suddenly cleared up because they found compressed layers of sediment at the bottom of the Grand Canyon that they could not explain or identify from erosion. These were things that were compressed very quickly and it was not over a very long period of time because the sedimentation was only a few inches. This was the fact that these was all the sedimentation from the floodwaters being compressed and being processed. He also mentioned that there was a renowned archeologist and she had found a fossilized thigh bone of a T-Rex, one of the finds of her career. Unfortunately, as she was doing further research, she found that inside that fossilized thigh bone, there was still viable bone marrow. In other words, we can make dinosaurs like they did in Jurassic Park. We have their DNA. We can clone them. Don't be surprised if a dinosaur wanders down your neighborhood someday. She reported her findings and the industry attacked her and ostracized her and drove her from the scientific community. 
So her findings suggested thousands of years since the dinosaurs, not millions. Tissue can only last a few thousand years under the proper protection. It can never last millions of years, nor billions of years. So in other words, just like the book of Job, dinosaurs were living side by side with man. Now, there is a book I strongly recommend. It's called, It's a Young World After All. And this book suggests that there were clocks in nature. And when this creative process ceased, that clock began to run. And they have several clocks they're dealing with. One of these clocks deals with the debris up in space. All the little particles and the rocks and the stones and the meteorites. And as our world passes through that section of space and its orbit around the sun, it's like a giant vacuum cleaner. And our gravitational field sucks it in. And if we've been doing this for billions of years, believe me, it's going to be a clean neighborhood for our planet. The planet is, the neighborhood is not clean. It is still filled with debris. It's thousands of years old, not millions. The big one we just celebrated last a week ago, a week and a half ago, the moon landing. The moon is a perfect test for the age of the, of the solar system. The moon has no wind, it has no storms, it has nothing to disturb the moon's surface. And so dust is another clock that is running in the universe. And every day so much dust falls on the earth and so much dust falls on the moon. So, if the moon has been there for millions of years, you're talking about dust very deep on the moon. And when Neil Armstrong stepped off the pad, they had big pads at the bottom of the lunar landing module, he stepped to see if it would support his weight or would he sink down into it. We had the big pad so that we would not sink into the moon dust. And when he stepped on the moon, his footprint was in that much dust. The moon has not been there for millions of years. It's only been there for thousands of years. So these millions and billions of years that the scientists need to discuss evolution is not supported by scientific evidence. If you want to take a look at a DVD on Amazon, it's called Is Genesis History. It's discussing massive geological events. It talks about Mount St. Helens. It talks about the Grand Canyon. And it adds something else that's very interesting. They have a gentleman there on the DVD that has a triceratop horn fossil. And he has the same situation as the T-Rex thigh bone. Inside the horn of the triceratops, there is viable bone marrow. Now, Dr. Oliver, who was the one who came to do the presentation, says that based upon all available evidence, there is no proof of creation. That is their watchword. They're based upon all available evidence. We cannot prove creation. Dr. Oliver then pointed out the reason there is no available evidence is that the scientific community has been hiding it away in warehouses for decades. So they are trying to suppress the evidence that disagrees with their theories. Verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over the, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Notice the use of the pronoun are. Let us, that's plural, make man in our, that's plural. Who is God speaking to? Some suggest he is talking to the heavenly host. 
but the heavenly hosts were never involved in the creative process. Look at Colossians 1.16. For by him, speaking of Jesus, were all things created that are in the heaven, which is the heavenly hosts and Satan and the fallen angels, and that are in the earth, visible and invisible. There are life forms in our world that are invisible to us. I believe these are spiritual beings, such as our demons and our angels, and we cannot see them. But the Bible does talk about invisible life forms here on the earth, whether they be thrones or principalities or powers. All things were created by him, Jesus, and they were created for him. So with that, let's go ahead and close it down for next week. And let's go ahead and end in prayer. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this time together. Thank you for this information. Father, you have said what you've done to create our world, Father, and you put the evidence in your creation to prove that you did what you said you did. And all we have to do is learn where to look for it. Father, we can trust your word, we can trust you, and you are our creator, Father, and you have a plan for our life. So lead us, guide us, and direct us in all things, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.